So I have here four slide sets. The first one, as you see here from the name of it, it says average normal stress and average year stress. Now it's gonna be really important that you understand the concept of normal stress or axial stress, if you like to call it axial stress. The second one, slide number set number 13, it says here beam bending. And then after that, it's gonna be beam flexure stresses or stress and then combined loading. This combined loading means axial and bending at the same time. Uh, just you know, the way that I put here for you guys who didn't uh, take my course before, any courses with me, usually I have the slide set is going to be called, let's say, 463. It's going to be slide set number one, slide set number one, slide set number two, number two. And then you have the title of the slide set. And then the difference between the first and the second, that the second here is going to be colored slides. So you don't print this. You'll print this. If you want to print, you'll print this. Let me give an example here. The first slide set here is this one here. I may show it to you. You have two slides per page, and this gives be the same thing that you have in all of this slide sets. And if it has C at the end, it means it's gonna be colored. It's gonna be similar to this. So you don't wanna print this, right? Maybe like if you're interested in printing, maybe you'd print this. So the first slide set that I have here for, from the three and one, from the mechanics of materials is gonna be actually about axial stresses and the meaning of the axial stresses. Also, we call this normal stresses. This normal stress, it happens because you have either tension or compression on, um, on a member. And this member usually is gonna be like one line member. One line means it looks like a line, like a rebar, for example. And then you have tension through it or compression through it. And if you want to find out the stress, you just take the force divided by the cross-section area of this number or this element. Similar to what we have here. For example, in this member, here's a cross-section area. You have a force of P. You take it divided by the cross-section area of this member. You're going to have uniform stress. It's going to be called here, this notation we call it sigma. Usually in concrete design, we like to use the term F. We don't really use the term sigma. Sigma is widely used when we were taking the statics, mechanics of materials, but usually when it comes to concrete, we prefer to use this um, F instead of sigma here. So in this slide set, it is complete slide set on definition for normal stress, normal strain. Also the amount of the strain, if you remember, the strain is gonna be equal to the extension of the member divided by the original member length. And based on the stress strain relationship, you can come up with the modulus plasticity if you want to. It shows here, all the way up to here, it shows how do you figure it out, how do you do the stress, and this type of analysis that I want you really to go through. Don't ignore it, it's gonna be kind of critical to you. Now, here we go now, the shear stresses, it's not gonna be critical at this time, but we may need it towards the end of this course. But for now, I want you really to go through this. You have here five pages, four and a half pages, like nine slides. Please go through them. And if you have here one of these examples, please do it. Second slide set is about beam bending. You need to understand the meaning of a beam. I understand that all of you guys, you have taken already 408, but I wanna be sure that you're still good when it comes to structure analysis, statics and generally speaking structure analysis, that you have beams and these beams can be simply supported, can be continuous. Generally for us, we're gonna be dealing with simply supported beams. But you need to understand that usually in pre-stress, you have continuity, you have this continuous beam analysis and slab design that most likely is gonna be continuous. But for most of our examples, it is gonna be simply supported. Just to make you guys feel of it more. I mean, it's gonna be kind of a little bit complicated once you have a continuous beam and then you look at the, at the profile of the cables or tendons and the understanding of the stress distribution throughout the beam. So most likely we're gonna be working with simply supported beams. You need to understand the meaning of positive shear, negative shear. 
Now passive shear, the left side of the beam is gonna be lifting up because of the forces and the meaning of passive moment and negative moment. So passive moment usually when you have the tension at the bottom. Some people may relate the moment to the direction of rotation. So for example, you say, if it's gonna be counterclockwise, it's gonna be positive. So you look at this side and say, it is positive. How about this side? Negative, no. I mean, this moment here is positive because it's causing tension at the bottom, compression at the top. If you have negative moment, if you have cantilever or continuous beam right above the support, you're gonna see negative moment, meaning tension at the top, compression at the bottom. In this slide set, you're gonna see some examples of beams with some point loads. And here we'll be doing the reactions. So you do reactions. Um, you just solve the beam here. You find out the reactions for different type of loading. And then also you need to understand how to do the shear diagram and the moment diagram. This is going to be very important for you guys that you need to learn it. You need to be familiar with it. I know that you have studied this maybe some times ago, but now it is the time to review it and be sure this week, by this weekend, that everything is clear to you. Different beam loading. And absolutely, mom diagram is going to be looking completely different than the other simply supported beam with just uniform load or just a point load. So I want you guys to go through this and be sure that you are familiar with it. Flexure stresses is going to be very, very extremely critical for us. We're going to spend lots of hours just working on the stress distribution in beams. So here's a beam, kind of a regular section. It's going to be exposed to some moment. And this is what you call here flexure. You're going to have here tension at the bottom, compression at the top. And also you need to think about the deformation, what happens. See, when you have tension here, lines is going to be coming away from each other. The compression side, they're going to be getting closer to each other. And then after that, we need to study here the stress distribution due to moment only. So this is what we will call here flexure. So flexure stresses is gonna be very similar to normal stresses, but there's a difference. Normal stresses, usually we refer to it when we have actually loaded member. In here, we have only moment applied to the beam, but we still have this normal stress. But this normal stress, now we're gonna be using it flexure stress instead of normal stress, if you like. The other one, you can call it normal stress, axial loading. This one here is going to be normal stress, flexure loading, which means moment, due to some moment applied to it. If you have simply supported beam in the top, you're going to have compression. In the bottom, you're going to have tension. Neutron ax axis is going to be right. I mean, if you have a rectangular section, this is going to be right in the middle. So it depends on the geometry of the section. This neutral axis location, is gonna, again, is going to be based on the geometry of the section. If the section here is homogeneous, which means made out of the same material, the stress distribution analysis is gonna be that simple. It's gonna be based on the moment of inertia, and it's gonna be based on the location. Like in this case here, the only way that you can come up with this distribution if you have homogeneous material. But if you have reinforced concrete, conventional reinforced concrete beam, stress distribution is gonna be looking like this. It's gonna be completely different. And you guys understand the reason, because concrete is going to crack. In pre-stressed, most likely, we are not allowed the concrete to crack. And if we let it crack, it's going to crack for a limited amount of stresses. We don't want it to be similar to reinforced concrete, conventional concrete. Besides, in pre-stressed beams, you're going to have combination of moment and axial loop. So stress distribution is going to be very critical that we need to study. Finding out this stress distribution is going to be now your baby. You really need to understand this and you need to work with it. Whether it's come to strain, whether also it's going to come to stresses. And remember that sigma max, now it's going to be F max. It's going to be all the way in the top. And the stresses here or the stress at any line is going to be a relationship between the Y distance, which means distance from the neutral axis to the point of interest divided by y top, which means the distance from the neutral axis all the way to the top fibers. And then at the end, we're going to have this equation that you need to work with. It says here, the stress at any point due to flexure is going to be equal to the moment. 
applied moment on the beam. And it's gonna be divided by the moment of inertia. Now I would understand that this moment of inertia, this is something that you guys know how to do it. It was in the statics, it was also mechanics of materials. It's gonna be very important that you know how to do the moment of inertia for a section, a given section. And then it's gonna be multiplied by Y. Y is gonna be the distance from the neutral axis to the point of interest. Meaning, if I'm interested in the stress here at this point, not all the way in the top, I'm gonna to say the stress at this point is gonna be equal to the applied moment divided by the moment of inertia, but by, by this Y distance. Looking for the maximum stress in the top, you're gonna to be using this C lower case, if you like to get to that point. Same thing at the bottom. So this equation is gonna be very important for us to understand and to see how we're gonna be using it. Wood is homogeneous material. And in this case, I can do the stress distribution like this. Same thing as structured steel. Same thing as uncracked concrete sections. If there is no cracking yet, I can consider it to be homogeneous and I can do this stress distribution. A good example here, and with this example, because homogeneous rectangular, neutral axis is gonna be right in the mid height, six inches above, six inches below. And this gonna be a very good example that shows you how to do the moment of inertia, how to find out the stress distribution throughout the depth of the beam. So it's gonna be very important for you guys that you know how to plot this diagram or this stress distribution throughout the depth of the beam. You need to be trained for this. Also, you're gonna end up with a couple of forces. If you like to do integration for this stress block or prism, you're gonna end up with some force here on the top, some force on the bottom, and the moment applied on the section is gonna be equal to this force multiplied by the distance between them. Another homogeneous section, and here you have been asked to find out the stresses at point C and at point B, two different points due to this applied loading. It's gonna be a good example that you, I want you guys to go through it. The last slide set for this addition materials is gonna be about combined stresses or combined loading. This means that you're gonna have, as you see here in this system, you're applying here, let's say that you're tightening it up. So what you're doing here, you're applying here compression and at the same time you have also some moment acting on it. Now we have a couple of forces, rotational force, which means a moment and axial force, which means this compression force that you're adding. So this little section of this saw is exposed to axial force and some moment. So the stress is not only due to an axial force, it's not only due to bending, which means flexure, it's gonna be here combined loading. So this is gonna be the first type of stress that you can think about or work with which means the stress is gonna be equal to the force divided by the cross-sectional area, which is very simple, we understand this. Due to moment, the stress at any point here is gonna be equal to the moment divided by moment of inertia, multiplied by this point C, if you are aiming to get to the maximum stress or to the distance from neutral axis to the point of interest. Now in our business here, we need to combine them. We're gonna put them all together. Very similar to this case. Just imagine if this is gonna be a section and then I have two types of loading. I have an axial load on this cross-section area and I have moment on the same cross-section area. So in reality, I have combined loading. So in order for me to, to be able to study it, I'm gonna split it into two separate loading diagrams. This is here compression on the section. So this signals up here. Now, later on in our business of structure analysis and on concrete design, we're gonna be using the term F. The stress here due to axial load is gonna be equal to P, which means the axial load divided by the contact area, the cross-section area A. So this is gonna be segment due to P. Also, I have moment. But when you have moment here, one side is gonna be tension, the other side is gonna be compression. Now I have two ends to this section. I have end number one or point number one and point number two, the same two points. The only thing is this gonna be two separate loading on the same section. So what happened, I split them to treat each one of this loading case separately. Now I need to add the effect of both of these two loadings. How they add the effect of both of these two loadings? 
it means I need to look at the stress at point one due to axial load and also at point one due to moment and add them to each other. Same thing at point two. I'm going to be taking the stress at point two from axial loading and add it to the stress at point two from moment. I said, okay, let me figure out the stress due to axial load again, P over A. The stress due to the moment is going to be equal to M divided by the moment of inertia times C. But one side is going to be tension, the other side is going to be compression. But when you look at this axial load, it's going to be the whole thing is going to be compression. Now, what can you do? Add the stress at point one here to the stress at point one there. The stress here is going to be compression, and here is going to be tension. So it's going to be subtractive. And the stress at point two is going to be compression due to axial load, and the stress at two due to mom is going to be what? Compression. So it's going to be additive. Meaning I need to add this component to this component. One time is going to be positive when there's compression. The other time is going to be negative when you have tension in one side. So this is the reason that I have plus or minus, which means at one point, at point number one, for example, is going to be subtractive and the point number two is going to be additive. Why? Because point one, you have your compression from the axial load, tension from the moment. While in point two, you have compression due to axial load and moment. So this is the reason that you see here, plus or minus. This equation is going to be extremely important when it comes to pre-stress concrete analysis. You're going to see it everywhere. Every time that you need to work on a pre-stress beam, you need to apply this equation. If you are doing, of course, this is going to be hand analysis. I have an example here to a column. So this looks like a column, right? And it has an axial load. If this axial load had been in the center, which means that the neutral axis we call concentric loading or concentric column. But because this axial load is shifted, if you see here, it's not really in the center, we call this offset. And we call the distance, this five inch from the neutral axis to the point load, we call this eccentricity. So this column here is called eccentric loading because you have the point load is shifted or offset. There is an offset. So this axial, axial loaded column, it has an axial load plus some moment. I don't know what happened. All right, here we go. So at the bottom, if you look here at the reaction, you're going to have this axial load plus some moment and the moment equals load times the eccentricity. This is going to be so critical for you to understand now because once it comes to pre-stress, you're not going to be going that slow on that because I would assume that you guys you understand it and this is something from the past from mechanical materials that you're aware of and now this is your chance to go through it. So now we're going to have two loading. One of them is going to be the axial loaded force, 150 pounds. The other one's gonna be rotational load, which is a 750 pound inch. How do we come up with this 750? It's gonna be equal to 150 times the five inch, the amount of eccentricity that you have on the loading. And then we have some analysis here that I want you guys to go through it, right? So this is very similar to point one and point two that I have here in this slide. You find out the stress due to axial load and stress due to moment. Stress due to axial load is going to be most likely compression. Due to moment, one side is going to be compression, one side is going to be tension, like any other beam. And this is exactly what you have here in this analysis, in this example. And look at the analysis here. They say that we have sigma B and sigma C. Why B and C? Because we have two points. You have this point B and this point C. Very similar to my example of point one and point two. At one of them, look at the stress here. It says negative P over A, you have compression, which is point B. And then when it comes here to the flexural stress, I have normal stress of tension. So look at what happened here. When the moment is rotating this direction, if you look just at the effect of the moment on that section, it's gonna be tension on point B and compression on point C. 
So at point C, the stress from moment and absolute is going to be additive. And the stress here on this side is going to be subtractive. Why? Because the moment is causing tension and the axial load is causing compression. This is the reason that you see here negative, positive, because it's going to be tension. It's going to be negative, negative. So this is going to be here additive stresses. At the end, it's going to be compression. But look what happened here. The stress due to moment as a numeric value, it turned to be higher than the effect of the compressive stresses. This is why at the end, I end up with some tension. But look what happened. If this value here had been smaller than this, you end up with compression both sides. I know that you guys, you went through this already, but now this is again your chance to back check it, review it, and be sure that you understand the whole thing about it. Another block or concrete column, or let's say steel column, masonry column, wood column, it has this point load P, and then I have this eccentricity. E stands here for eccentricity, E sub Y. And then they ask here to find out at what point, if you are moving this point P, right? If this point load P is moving right or left, at one point, the stress here is gonna be equal to zero, right? And the reason that we are doing this because there is something here that we call the core. And the core, you can draft it here or you can draw it. And the core is gonna be the boundaries for this point load. If you keep it within the core, you're gonna have only compressive stresses. And once you take the point load out of the core, you're gonna have tension on one side. So if you're target and you're aiming to keep the entire section in compression, you cannot take this point load out of this core. This is the core I'm talking about. So as long as you keep this point load within this diamond shape, you're gonna have only compression on the section, meaning, if you bring this point load right here, if we point right at point G, what's gonna happen? The stress at point A is gonna be equal to zero. And if you bring this point load P up to this point F, this side here, the tensile stress is gonna be equal to zero, which means there's not gonna be any tension in this side. Once you start to move this point load P out of this core, you're gonna see some tension on the other side of the concrete column. I have a question. Yeah. So if that point load is, say it's not on the neutral axis, but it's in that shaded area. Yeah. It's still considered eccentric or can it be considered concentric if it's in the air, the shaded area? If it's gonna be within this area, you still yeah. call it eccentric. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be only called concentric if it's gonna be right here at the intersection of the two axes, X and Y. Okay. But what happened is, um, if you have a small eccentricity, if I may go back here to this example, if I have a small eccentricity, which means a small moment, numerical value, this 11.25, is gonna be much less than the compressive value coming from the axial load effect. In a case like this, you're gonna end up by compression in both sides. This one you have a small eccentricity. If the big, the, the eccentricity is becoming big enough, which means that you have taken this point load out of the shaded area, out of the core, you're gonna start to see here some tension. And this is what happened here in this example. So in this example, one side was having some tension because this point, this five inches, is totally out of the core, out of the shaded area for that specific column. So again, concentric means the point load is right at the intersection here, right at the dead point, the dead center of the beam section or the column section, right? Yeah. Once you move it, it's gonna be eccentric loading or eccentric beam or column. It's gonna happen a lot in pre-stress. It's gonna be very important that you understand what's happening here. Once you take this point load out of the shaded area, you're gonna see some tension in one of the sides. And what's the importance of tension? Because once you say that we have tension, it means concrete is gonna crack at this location. All right? In this machine here, we are putting here some compression. So it's gonna be some force going up. This force here, when you look at section A, A is gonna be causing tension and moment on it. 
Now in pre-stress, you're not gonna see a case like this. In pre-stress, it's gonna be a case very similar to this, or very similar to this. This is gonna be like a very standard case when you have here pre-stress concrete. This is why this example is gonna be extremely important to you. This example A2, I want you guys to do it by hand. It's gonna be really important because you're gonna be repeating this a few times when it comes to pre-stress analysis. Now, this, this uh, uh, kind of column or pedestal here, this one you have two point loads, and then they're asking you to find out the stresses at a couple of points. Um, it is true that a case like this may happen in pre-stress, but we don't really go there. We don't put more than one point load at a time. We try to make it kind of um, straightforward so that the concept is clear. All right. We're done so, with all the slides. Yes, go ahead. In, in a case like this, would you be able to average them and put it into a single, combine it into a single point load? Um, it depends on the meaning of averaging. Yeah. Because doing the average here, it's not going to be 500 or 300. No, it's going to be find out the resultant of these two forces. How do you find out the resultant? The resultant is going to be equal to 800 kilonewton, right? Yeah. And the big issue is where is going to be the location of it? The location, yeah. That's what you I meant. The find location. the X and Y location for it. Mm. So if you want to find out the resultant of these two forces with its location in terms of the eccentricity in the X and Y direction, yes, it can give you exactly the same results as if you use here these two um, point loads and find out the stresses due to them at the four points, four corners, A, B, and let's call it C and D. Are we good? Yeah. All right, excellent. Very good. So what I want you guys to do is to take a um, five minute break and we're gonna be back, let's say at eight and five minutes. And please, once you get him back, to the meeting, type your name in the chat room. So I have about maybe eight oh, minutes. Did you say hide our name? What's that? Hide our name? No, I'm saying type your name. Sign in again. Type your name in the chat room. Oh, okay. All right. See you in seven minutes. Is everybody back? Yes. Did I hear everybody? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. All right, here's the first slide set for this course. Choose, choose here some information that I'm sure that you guys, you have it in the syllabus. Why I put the syllabus here and put it here in a second. Gonna have homework and also we're gonna have a course, a course project. Look at the grade distribution here. The project plus participation in some quizzes is gonna be 25%. At the time when I ask you to do a project submittal, I'm gonna call it here project submittal, you're not gonna have a homework. So you're going to be either have a submittal, project submittal, or you're going to have a homework. So you may think about the, the project here submittal to be a substitute for the homework. So it's going to be either this or that. And this is the list that I was talking about. Some of them is going to be in Zoom. Some of them is going to be in person. 
depends on the day. And at certain point, if we feel that we need to change this and put more it's gonna be in Zoom, we may do this, just depends on the situation. Let's hope not. Now the books that they want you guys to have. This is gonna be a very important document. If you really is gonna be interested in pre-stress, you're gonna be in the structure business, you need to have this. This is kind of a manual. It is not really um, like a, a textbook, but it's a manual that you need to have. And you may have also free copy, you know? You can also download, I'm sure that there are some free copies around, you can just download them for free. I listed here also some references. If you like, this is gonna be like important books. If you'd like to go back and, and study um, like pre-stress concrete. The same book here, which is a building code, the 318, 2014, this is gonna be the same code that we use here for pre-stress. So if you have this from the 408, it's gonna be helpful. If you have this book, whether you have a printed copy or maybe you have an electronic copy, a PDF, this is gonna work fine with you. It's gonna be the same book. Good portion of this course is gonna be the analysis of pre-stress sections to understand how it works. You need to understand that this is gonna be really critical that I want you, I'd like to emphasize on, the, emphasize on this again. The first four slide sets that you went through in the first half of this lecture is gonna be really important that you go through them, especially for this combined loading of combined stress when you have Excel loaded and then you have a moment with it. You're gonna see a lot of these when it comes to pre-stress concrete and you need to be very familiar with it. You need to understand it because at that time, we're not gonna have chance to go back and study them again. We'll need to move forward right away. So first, we're gonna be going through introduction of pre-stress, the meaning of it, and we're gonna have a few videos for you guys. That's gonna be great if you can watch them to understand what's going on in the, in the planet, in the factory. And then you need to understand this combination of pre-stressing force. And actually the pre-stressing force, if you may think about it, is gonna be this axial force applied on a column, eccentric column. And here's the pre-stress force, it's not gonna be right in the center. Most likely is there's gonna be some offset. In lots of analysis, we assume that's gonna be right in the middle, just to make it easy. It was gonna be right at the neutral axis of the section at the end of the beam. But throughout the beam itself, we're not gonna keep it at the center. And this was gonna be creating the eccentricity. Now you need to understand what does mean by pre-stress and precast. We have lots of concrete members that are precast, but they are not pre-stressed. For example, if you are looking here at any vault for electrical, um, like phase or for some, uh, or maybe catch phase in, if you guys are working civil or maybe ducts and stuff like this, it's gonna be precast, but there is no pre-stressing. Why do we do it precast? Because it's gonna be much simpler for you to go and buy it. You don't need to create a special form for it. Just buy it there from the precaster, haul it from the, from the yard to your construction site and just put it there with the crane. So it's gonna be much simpler than doing a formwork, put the reinforcing and cast the concrete. Now, when it comes to pre-stress, we have two types of pre-stress. We have post-tension and pre-tension. So in the term here, pre-tension, it means that you apply the tension and then you pour the concrete. In post-tension, you pour the concrete and then you apply the tension in the cable. So we have your two terms, pre-tension and post-tension. Both of them, we call them pre-stress. So if I say here pre-stress, it doesn't mean it's gonna be pre-tension or post-tension, I don't know yet. So both of these two types, pre-tension and post-tension, both of them you consider to be pre-stressed. Again, what's pre-tension? Pre-tension means you apply the tension to the cable and then you pour the concrete. 
Post tension means you put the concrete and then you apply the tension to the cable. We're gonna be going through all of these details. And of course, videos is gonna be make this uh, much clear to you, more clear to you guys. At certain point, we need to do the end block design. What is the end block? At the end of this pre-stress beam, you're gonna be having high compressive stresses come from the cable. And this has here a special design. So we're gonna be going through this at certain point. This is the same grading policy that you have in the syllabus. And with that, I'm done with the first slide set. It is mainly like the syllabus if you like. Now this here is the second slide set that we're gonna be going through today. And as you see here, this is mainly about review for conventional concrete design. This is gonna be for the 408. So most of the slides are taken from the 408. And now I guess it's gonna be important that we go through it before we continue and start the pre-stress analysis and design. The main code that we all follow if you like to put here a building together, you go to any jurisdiction, you ask him which code I'm going to be using. They say, well, it is mainly the IBC, 2018 IBC International Building Code. But since you're in California, it's giving the California Building Code, 2019 CBC. So what is different between the two? The CBC here, it is simply adopts the IBC 2018, and then they do some changes to it. Meaning the mother code is gonna be the IBC 2018, which is used let's say in the state of Nevada, strictly they just use 2018 IBC. But when you come here to California, they call it 2019 CBC. It's gonna be the same code, a little bit of changes. Now, within this code, you're gonna see a chapter and the entire chapter is chapter 19, it refers to the 2014 American Concrete Institute 318-14. So 14 is gonna be the year. So actually this is what happens. Chapter 19 of this code is actually the ACI 318-2014. Question is, do I need to go back to 2019 CBC? I'm gonna say no. You just need it for the loading. Let's say that you have dead load life load definition of it. Uh, seismic forces, how do you figure it out? This type of stuff, you're gonna find it in this code. Otherwise, if you are doing concrete design, you can just go to chapter 19 of this California building code, at which it refers you to this book, which you have. So now I guess we understand which code we're gonna be using. We are actually once used 318, the ACI 318, 2014, as if you are using the IBC or the CBC, because actually this is just a chapter of it. But instead of taking the entire book and put it as a chapter, you go there to the CBC or IBC, you open the chapter 19, you're gonna see maybe five, six pages. It just tells you here, go ahead and use this uh, book instead with the following changes, very minor changes that it's not really critical to you at this point. Now for the type of concrete, we have two types of concrete. We have plain concrete, and then we have also reinforced concrete. So what's the definition of plain concrete? What's the definition of reinforced concrete? Plain concrete is gonna be any concrete that does not have any reinforcing or it has some reinforcing below the minimum required by code, by the ACI. You reinforce concrete, it means that you have enough reinforcing. It's gonna be higher than the minimum required by code. Couple of examples here. Now materials, what do we have in concrete mix? We have cement, and most likely you're gonna be using this Portland cement or hydraulic cement. Why hydraulic cement? Because if you go here to any patch, if you go here to any precast fabricator, they may have this hydraulic cement. It could be easier for them. So it depends on the availability. It could be hydraulic cement, it could be Portland cement. 99.9% .9 of the cases is gonna be this Portland cement. Just easier, more available to people, 
and this is usually the one that we're going to be working with. And for this cement here, to call it a cement, this material, this powder, whatever powder, right? With this gray color, the cement color, it needs to comply with the requirements of ASTM C150, which we called here specification. So what is ASTM? American Standards for Testing and Materials. What's the importance of this document? What does it do? This document within the ASTM constitutes the material. So for example, you go there to this ASTM standard, and then you look at it, you say, what does it mean by Portland cement? It gives you the chemical composition of Portland cement. If you want to call whatever material that you bring to us, let's say that you are sitting here in, in a lab, right? And then you bring some material and say, I want to be sure that this is Portland cement. It looks like powder, it looks like cement. It needs to satisfy or comply with the requirements of this standard, meaning chemical compositions and all the limits for all submaterials need to comply with the requirements of this specification. Also, the shape, the color. You cannot just have it at any color. You got to be careful here because there are certain colors. Otherwise, you cannot call it portent cement. You can call it something else. Same thing with reinforcement bars. You bring a piece of bar here and then say, is this a reinforcing bar? Can I call it reinforcing bar? Can I use it in concrete? We're going to say, well, it needs to comply with ASTM A615, meaning chemical properties is going to be critical. Mechanical properties, meaning tension strength and modulus plasticity and the whole thing, and ductility. Deformation, which means this reps around the rebar that we use for bond. Size and shape and color, all of that. If you cannot comply with the requirements or satisfy these requirements for the A615, you cannot call it a rebar and you cannot use it in concrete design. You cannot, for example, bring aluminum bar and use it in a steel state because the code doesn't let you do this. Maybe you can, you can just do it in your own, but you cannot do it in a building. Because if you do it in a building, you need to comply with the code. Which code now is give you this 2019 CBC. And 2019 CBC, it refers to this code. And if you look here at the rebar type that you can use in this code, you're going to see aluminum bars. So actually, you cannot use aluminum bars. You can just do an experiment or do it in your backyard, but you cannot do it for actual building that you're going to be liable and responsible for. Here's the cement, this is the way it looks like. And we have two major types of cements that we use. This give me this cement type two and type five. Type two is like the general. This is gonna be the standard cement, conventional cement if you like. And type five is gonna be the high sulfate resistant cement. Usually in precast, we use this type two and pre-stressed. But it depends also on the order that you're gonna be placing. If you're going to be doing bridges, most likely you're going to be using type five because the exposure to sulfate and to chemical. And in many cases for the same members, you can have it made out of type two or type five. It depends on the use. If you think that you're going to have high sulfate exposure to the member, you're going to go with this cement type. Availability is going to be very critical for you to decide because in many cases, we try to use high sulfate resistance cement in pre-test members. And if we couldn't, we just buy it and then we paint it with epoxy with some material here to make a barrier between the chemicals and between the pre-test member. Now the aggregate. Also the aggregate, it needs to comply with this ACM. We have fine aggregate like the sand, and then we have coarse aggregate like the gravel or the rock. And also, they need to comply with these requirements, right? If you are going to have lightweight member, if you like to produce here a lightweight concrete member, maybe you'd like to use this lightweight aggregate, which needs to comply with another ASTM number here. So it's going to be very critical that you know which aggregate you're going to be going with and what type of concrete that you're going to be working with. 
Most likely, when we have pre-stress, we would like to use normal weight aggregate, which means normal weight concrete. We don't like to go to lightweight, especially for cast in place members. But if you go to any park construction with pre-stressed members, you can go to larger spans. And part of what you need to support here is going to be the dead load, which means the self-weight of the structure itself. So the joists themselves and the beams, most likely they're going to be made of lightweight concrete. Why? Because when you reduce the weight, you're going to put here less rebars, less tendons, and so forth. So the cables can be much less. So in a lot of all the precast parking structures that you have been through, the double T's and the joists and dismembers, they are made out of lightweight concrete to reduce the weight and therefore reduce the dead load and reduce the amount of reinforcement that you need to put through. So if it is done in the factory, most likely it's going to be much easier. So most likely it's going to be lightweight and it's gonna be much easier to control the product the production of the concrete in the facility. But if you are doing it on the side, it's gonna be most likely normal with concrete. <coughs> now, some information about the sand and it needs to be clay, uh, clean of clay and any chlorides. And I mean, you guys, you have taken this already, you understand it. For the coarse aggregate, the size of the coarse aggregate, the maximum size of the aggregate is going to be based on the size of the concrete member. And this is also from the 408. Actually, the entire slide set here is going to be about everything that you have taken here in 408. Weight of concrete. If you have normal weight concrete, most likely we're going to be using 150 pounds per cubic foot. If you have lightweight concrete, it's going to be 110 to 115. If you have no idea, they're going to go to these two numbers in this kind of by default. But if you decide here to go with lightweight and you have information, there's going to be maybe 115. Go ahead and use 115. Some people would use 117 a lot. So I'm going to say 110, 15, maybe 17. But in our problems here, and for this course, we need to give you the number. But I'm just giving you here numbers that you can use if you don't know and you are practicing engineering design, structural engineering design. Not just any water that you can use, right? You got to use water that confirms with or comply with the STM C1602. It's going to tell you here that if you can drink the water, it means that you can use it for concrete. If it's safe, it is like tap water, it's going to be okay. Most likely, it's not going to have colorides. There is no salt, there is no organic materials, right? This is why you can have it in the tap. So if you like to do a small project in your backyard, you can buy the concrete and mix it. Let's say at home, if you want to in your backyard, you can mix it with water from the tap water. Uh, like this small project, you can do it this way. You can bring a small mixer, right? Or you can just do it by hand. And this one here, if you're gonna have a planet or you're gonna have to purchase concrete from a supplier. Now, concrete strength. What type of strengths are we talking about? The concrete strength here, it says that it ranges from 2,500 to 6,000 PSI. And this can be like the standard range that if you like to order concrete, this is what you're gonna see in the market. But you can easily go to 20,000 PSI, but in this case, we're gonna be calling it high performance concrete, HPC. It's between 6,000 and 20,000. You don't want to go there unless you have to. Usually in precast members, we don't go below 5,000. So most likely it's going to be 5,000 PSI. Here is a stress strain relationship. And I want to be careful and remind you guys that the ACI is a PSI code. So this code here is a PSI code. Don't use caps, don't use foot. When it comes to any analysis, the code is gonna be in pound and inch. So remember this. Pound, um, yeah. Um, naturally, like one would think, oh, the stronger, the better. But 
is the reason that we don't want to go to higher strength PSI because it attracts more forces? No, because um, just the cost. The cost is cost. important. Yeah, you know, I mean, why would you go to 8,000 if it's going to be pricey and you can do the same thing with 5,000 or 6,000, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, it's good when you go to stronger, right? The stronger, the better in terms of gravity members. When it comes mm. to seismic, it's going to be a different story, right? Yeah, that's awesome. Seismic and pressure members supporting lateral forces, different story. But when it comes to gravity members, of course, I'd like to go to 20,000. But who's going to pay for it? Yeah. Not me, right? Not you. One reason. Thank you. Here's the limit when it comes to concrete strength. They say, well, if it's gonna be this is general and this is gonna be special moment frame and structure walls mean seismic. I'm gonna put here this means seismic. Right. What's wrong? All right. This is going to be for seismic members. This is going to be gravity members. Normal weight and light with concrete. The minimum is 2,500. There is no maximum. You can just go to any value. If you can produce a concrete with much higher trends, go ahead, do it, prove it. Now, usually we're going to have this lambda factor if we have light weight concrete. I said, okay, what does it mean by this lambda factor? In certain equation, the code, I'm sure that you guys have gone through this already in the 408, you're going to see here is square root of f prime c. And once you see here is square root of f prime c, this needs to be in what? In psi. It has to be in psi. So I'm going to put this arrow next to it. I'm going to say, be careful. This needs to be in psi. For example, 4,000 psi, 5,000 psi. Never try to use this in ksi and then divide by 1,000. It doesn't work this way. Right? So the code is going to be based on pound and inch units. So what is this lambda factor? This lambda factor is a reduction. If you like to use lightweight concrete, this is going to be some reduction. And this reduction is giving the tensile strength of the concrete and usually is giving the shear. But when it comes to compression, you have no problem. So again, this is going to be for the tensile strength of the concrete, right? And it is going to be for the shear strength of the concrete. We usually like to use two types or two values for the lambda value, right? We say, if you have normal weight concrete, just use one. If you have light weight concrete, use 0.75. So someone here is gonna come and say, how about the other values? Why don't you use them? You can say, you know what? You have two types here of aggregate. You have the fine aggregate, which is the sand, and then you have the coarse aggregate, which is the rock or the gravel. So, okay, you can have normal weight sand and lightweight rock. But you can have normal weight rock and lightweight sand. So, okay. Or you can have all of them to be lightweight. So, we have here a few, right, cases. So, I'm going to say if everything is going to be all lightweight, which means coarse aggregate, and fine aggregate, all of them is going to be lightweight, just use 0.75. If you have normal weight, just use one, which means no reduction. Because we are used usually from contractors to come up with a change. They said, well, you ask here for lightweight concrete for the production of this structure member, the concrete member. But the only thing I was able to find from a concrete supplier that's going to be everything is going to be lightweight. I said, fine, good. I was ready for it. I used 0.75. Even if I come here in the specification and I said, the sand is going to be normal weight and the rock or the gravel is going to be lightweight, right? Let's say I specified this in my drawings and then all of a sudden, contractor is going to come back. It means that I used here 0.85 for the reduction factor. Now, all of a sudden, I see the contractor coming and saying, no, we have only all lightweight. Does mean I need to repeat all my calculations? I'm going to say no. This is why I'd like to use either 0.75 or 1 in my answer when you practice. But 
if you have, we're talking here about um, the academia and you have a problem and very specific, you can go the, to the actual or the specific lambda factor. But for me, I usually go either one or 0.75, just to make it easier myself. Now for the reinforcing steel bars, I'm sure that you guys are familiar with this diagram, stress strain relationship. And we have two types of rebars. We have the A615 and the A706. This could be for the conventional rebars. We have the yield point and the grade of the rebar, whether it's going to be 40, 60, or 75, means the yield strength of the rebar. And this F sub Y is going to be very critical. This is actually what we use in our analysis. We call this the yield strength, and this is going to be the yield strain. What's the yield strain? It's going to be the strain at which yield is going to start to occur. What's the yield stress? I'm going to say this is going to be the stress at which the yield plateau is going to start to occur. So what does it mean by yield? The yield is going to be this section of the diagram. Give me the yield. So what does it mean by that? It means that you apply some tension. You're going to see some extension from the rebar, and then you have this elastic relationship. At the beginning of this linear relationship, elastic performance. And then all of a sudden, you apply tension to the rebar. You see lots of extension, and there is no resistance. So the bar is yielding. It cannot take any more forces. Till it comes to a point that we call here strain hardening. The rebar is going to start to pick some strength again, and then it's going to be going up. So we really care about this point here, F sub y. When we come to rebar size, you have the standard rebar size according to the STM. You have the nominal damper, which means D sub B, we call this DB. If you guys remember, it's going to be called DB, D sub B, the bar damper. And this one here, it's called A sub B, cross section area for one rebar. Don't try to take the bar size and try to figure out the cross section area. It doesn't work this way, right? At any point, you're going to see the numbers here. This is going to be handed to you. Especially in this course, you guys know that this course is open notes, right? I'm sure that you guys are familiar with this. It means that you're going to have all your notes. So you don't need to try to figure out the cross section area based on the damper. You need to have it. Here's a rebar. And this is what we call here the formation of the rebar. And this is to create the bond between the concrete and between the rebar when you have tension. We call this bonded reinforcement. So now this is going to be a new term that we need to learn. This is going to be bonded. Oh, what's that? Reinforcing. What's the bond reinforcing? It's gonna be this reinforcing is gonna be bond to the concrete. Now this is gonna be new term. So once you hear here bonded reinforcement, it's gonna be this conventional reinforcing bonds. Because the cables for the pre-stressing, some of them they don't have any bond between the rebar or the cable and between the concrete. In some cases, we don't really need to have any bond between the two. So in this case, it's going to be unbonded, or we just call it tenderness. But in this case, I want to be sure that once you hear this term bonded reinforcing, it means we're talking about conventional rebars. Is there a difference between the spiral kind of ribs and the horizontal ribs in the last side? In or here? Bonded? This system and this system? Yes. Yeah, there's some differences because in this system here, they usually give you the grade. But in here, they don't give you the grade. The grade is not going to be written. But just have this. You see this grade line? Mm -hmm. Once you have one line, it means 60. If you have um, three lines, there is like a code for it. I see. Yeah. Um, but they're both bonded? Yeah. yeah. They're both, yeah they're both. As long as you have this, as long as you have this, the formation, we call this the formation. Some people call trips. You see this, they call it here mean reps. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you open the STM, Right? They call this deformation. Okay. So this deformation here is what is causing or providing the bond to the concrete around it. 
Right, right. Okay. Um, I see. Thank you. No problem. Some of the terminology that we use in concrete design, I'm sure that you guys have done this already. You know what does mean by B, you know what does mean by D, the depth, effective depth to the reinforcing bars to the centroid of the bars. H is gonna be the total depth of the concrete member, and AS is gonna be the total cross section area for the tension steam. But if you are gonna be taking here one rebar only, it's gonna be A sub B. A sub B is gonna be cross section area for one rebar only. A sub S is giving the total cross-section area for the tension steam. Now, when do you think concrete is going to start to crack? Concrete is going to start to crack once it reaches the stress of FCR, right? So when do you think it's going to be reaching FCR? FCR equals seven and a half square root of F prime C. In a case like this, F prime C, it has to be in what? PSI. It cannot be in KSI, right? Or KSF. Am I correct? You guys remember this? Yeah. <laughs> All our equations is gonna be in PSI. Now, this is a stress distribution here due to flexure that we discussed. And I said, I repeated this a few times. You really need to know how to do the stress distribution. I mean, open the old slide sets that I showed you from mechanics of materials. And you're gonna see here that you're gonna have this equation sigma equals in our case here, we'd like to call it F and come to stress and concrete analysis and design. So we're gonna call this F here, right? The stress F is gonna be equal to M divided by the moment of inertia, multiplied by Y. And Y is gonna be the distance from neutral axis to the point of interest. Looking for the maximum stress, you just take Y all the way here to the top, which is gonna be H over two. When we work with concrete before it cracks, we just ignore the presence of the reinforcing. And in a case like this, we say reinforcing is not there and the concrete is not cracked yet. Meaning concrete is gonna crack once the stress at the tension side is gonna be approaching seven and a half square root of a prime C. Now, where is the tension side? I'm gonna say, here's the tension side. It's gonna be the compression side, which means one, the stress, here, the stress here, value, approaches FCR, the modus fracture, which means seven and a half is square root of F prime C. When the stress at the bottom is gonna be reaching this value, right, what's gonna happen? Concrete is gonna start to crank. And in a case like this, you're not gonna have a homogeneous section anymore because the rebar is gonna start to be triggered. It's gonna start here to see some stresses. So stress distribution here, we understand it, and we understand that I can take this prism or this stress block and draw it here. The maximum stress can be given by this equation. And this is gonna be here H over two, right? Which means the one half of the height. This is gonna be H, total height here, total depth of the section is called H, according to this. This is gonna be here H over two and the width is gonna be B. For this stress block or prism, I can do integration, which means finding out the volume of this stress block. And this is gonna be equivalent to the compression force on the top. Meaning this compression force C is gonna be equal to what? I can say C equals the width B, right? The volume of this, the width B times H over two. You can see, yeah, it makes sense. Times H over two this height, apply by this stress times F. This is stress here, I'm gonna call it now F. And the whole thing divide by two, why? Why should I divide this by two? You say, because I have this triangular distribution of stresses. I'm gonna say B times H over two times F over two. Yeah, you can say here, here's a stress, right? divided by two, because you have this triangular distribution, you have this triangular area, times h over two, this height, or you can call it c here if you want to, c lowercase, and times b is gonna get you the volume, which means this force here, the compression force, c. Okay. It is a kind of general section, because you know, in pre-stressed, you're not gonna have rectangular section. Most likely it's gonna be T section or an I section, 
or a weird section, but usually we're going to give you here the moment of inertia and the section modulus. The whole thing here is going to be given to you. But let's say if I have a T section like this, it's going to be very important that you know you need to know uh, how to do it by hand. How do you find out the moment of inertia? How do you find uh, here Y top and Y bottom and the whole thing? The moment of inertia for just a rectangular section, one piece, is going to be given by this equation. The width times H cubed divided here by 12. So, okay, yeah, I know this. Moment of inertia for a composite section like this, when you have more than one section, is going to be summation of moment of inertia for each one of these rectangular sections, right? And then plus additional component, which is the cross section area for each one of these two sections times y squared. You have here definition for everything you have here. It says exactly what does mean by this, what does mean by that. In a case like this, you're going to end up by having two sections, section one, section two. You're going to have here the neutral axis that you know how to find it out from statics. And then y1 and y2 is going to be the distance from neutral axis to section one. Neutral axis to the centroid of section number two. This give you this one. The stress on the top, see this F top? Now I don't have any axial force. It's gonna be equal to M divided by I, moment divided by the moment, total moment of inertia for the entire section, multiplied by Y top. Now what is Y top in this case? Y top is gonna be the distance from the neutral axis all the way to the top fibers of the concrete. So what is this called here? Y top. Let me add it. So I'm going to say this distance here, I'm going to call it y top. You can call it just yt if you want to, like this. And what is y bottom? I'm going to say distance from here all the way to here. You can call this y bottom if you want to. What do you have here in this equation? I'm going to say it is right here. Moment divided by moment of inertia. Multiply by y top, it's going to get you here the stress at this point. The stress all the way at the bottom, if bottom, is going to be equal to the moment applied moment divided by the moment of inertia, multiplied by y bottom, which means the distance from neutral axis to here. Actually, this term, if I may take it like this, this term. Moment of inertia divided by y top is actually called S sub T, section modulus. This gonna be the section modulus for the top. This gonna be I divided by Y top. This why I can take this out, replace it with S top. You see this equation now becomes moment, applied moment divided by section modulus for the top, section modulus for the bottom. And you have here the definition, look at this. Here's S top and S bottom. And also you have an equation from here. Now, is this slide is gonna be important? I'm gonna say yes. Because in many cases, you're going to see here a T section or an I section for pre stress, and you need to do this type of a stress analysis. You really need to be good with this. And my advice to you start to do your stretching because you're going to have more than one homework at which you need to repeat the same steps. So start by having it ready. So have a spreadsheet ready to do the moment of inertia for you for an I section with two different flanges. So for example, I, the way I would do it, I'd bring here a piece like this, right? And another piece like this. Let's say for the web, let's give you three sections. And then maybe a larger piece at the bottom. So don't make the top and bottom flanges to be equal to each other. Be sure that you have more variables in your spreadsheet. If you didn't do it now, you're not going to have time to do it. And if you need to solve it by hand, it's going to take forever especially in homework and project. And it's going to get repeated a few times. Are you guys following me? Yeah, all right. When we come to the exam, you cannot really use your spreadsheet. I mean, so um, if you like to stay with just doing hand calculation analysis for your homework and for your uh, and project and for your exam, of course, for exam, it has to be um, and calculations, but when it comes to repeating yourself a few times, you're gonna be really tired. And you'd say, I really would like to have a spreadsheet to do this for me.
So, okay, here's one example, the cracking moment. How do you find out the cracking moment? We have two methods. We have the flexure formula method, and then we have the anterior couple method. What is the flexure formula method? Let me go back. This is the flexure formula method, which means this method here. What is the internal couple method? This when you take the force, one of these two forces multiplied by the distance between the two forces. So okay. When do you think concrete is gonna crack? When it is 4,000? Based on this. Yes, yeah, so it's gonna crack when FCR is gonna be equal to 474.3 PSI. So okay, this is gonna be the cracking stress. And how about the equation? What is this flexure formula method? I'm gonna say, you know what? Here's the equation. Equation says F equals to M divided by S. And this gave me the cracking moment in this case because when the stress and the tension side is approaching 474.3 PSI, the beam is going to crack. And therefore, we're going to call this the cracking stress and this gave me the cracking moment. Section modulus here is given by this equation, which means it's going to be the same as this equation here, but it's going to be just for a simple rectangular section. So if you apply all of this, and then you take a simple rectangular section, it's going to give you the same equation like what you're looking here at. The width here is 16 by 24. I'm going to say, okay, 16 by 24. Here's the section modulus. Someone's going to say, how about the rebars? Why didn't you count them? I'm going to say, when you're talking here about uncracked concrete, the rebars is not active yet. And when we come to moment of inertia, we don't really count on them. So you just disregard here the rebars. So keep this in mind. Before cracking, the three bars are not triggered yet, and you don't really need to consider it in your analysis. Okay. Now, let's take here this equation. I'm looking for the cracking moment. I have the section modulus. I have the cracking stress, the 474. Let me put in this equation. And now, how much is the cracking moment? Here we go. Here's the cracking moment. Any questions? We're good. Now let's work on units. This is in PSI. And this section modulus was in inch cubed. So the moment based on this two units is gonna be pound inch. Yeah, this is like what the ACI says, right? It's gonna be pounds and inches. But if you like to shoot the moment to some people, they're gonna say, well, this number is just big. Why don't you put it in kept foot? I'm gonna say, yeah. Because usually when they give you the beam span, it's gonna be in feet. When they give you the load, the load is gonna be in kips and kip per foot. So maybe you'd like to convert this and show it in kip foot at the end. So I understand that within the analysis itself, with the code equations, you'd like to stay with pound inch units for everything. But when you report moment or report shear, shear is getting kips, it's gonna be a force, and moment is getting kip foot. Now, here we go. We have a section. Now we are trying here to use internal couple method. Here's FCR, right? The stress. And one the stress here is gonna be reaching 474.3. We're gonna be figuring out the two forces. And the two forces, this force C or T, they're gonna be equal to each other. Is going to be equal to the stress on the top multiplied by the C, which is 12 divided by 2. You see this? This is going to be 12, right? And then you divide by 2 to find out the area of this triangle. So this is going to be here 12 inch times 474 divided by 2 area of this triangle multiplied by the width 16 inch. With that, you have the force, and then you can call it to your also in caps. Now you need to figure out the distance from the tension to compression. This point load here is going to be concentrated within the centroid of this triangle, which means at one third from the base. It's going to be four inches. Same thing here, four inches. Therefore, distance from C to T is going to be equal to 24 inch, subtracting eight inches. It's exactly what I've shown. And this is going to be the cracking moment. This value, it has to match this value. It cannot be different. You change the method of analysis, but you need to end up with the same number when we come to moment. Uh, difference here between T sections, rectangular sections, and so forth, right? And this where once you have here the tension, I mean, in 
continuous beams, this gonna be positive bending moment, negative bending moment. So positive bending moment is gonna be creating tension at the bottom, negative is gonna be creating tension at the top of the beam, reinforcing bars. Now, stress distribution and analysis of our beams, like the conventional beams that you usually work with. We have the same nomenclature. We have AS, we have the width B, we have the depth to the centroid of the rebar. This is going to be depth D. H is going to be the total depth. We have the concrete strength. And then we have this simplified compression block, which is 0.85 of prime C. And the depth of the block is going to be only A, which doesn't go all the way to the neutron axis. But the depth of the neutral axis in the reinforced concrete is going to be called here C, right? And this A, how do you relate A to C? The relationship is going to be based on this beta one, and beta one actually is going to be based on the concrete strength. Look here at this beta one. It says here beta one, you can just use this chart if you want to. If the concrete strength is going to be 4,000 or less, you're going to be using this 0.85. This is going to be 8,000 or more, use 0.65. In between, you can do this interpolation. And this is an equation here for the interpolation. It's going to be a very simple equation. So what is this beta 1? Again, beta 1, relationship between the compression block depth and the neutral axis depth. Now, is this important also for pre-stress? I'm going to see, yeah. The same beta 1 factor that you're going to see there. Now, let's do here. The integration for the stress block. This compression block equals to what? 0.85 prime C times the depth A times the width B to find out the volume, which means a compression force. As it says here, compression force C is going to be 0.85 prime C times B times A. Because we don't have externally applied forces like compression force, we're going to say C equals to T. When you set them equal to each other, you can solve for the term A. Because don't forget, when you start with this section analysis, the information given to you is going to be all of these dimensions and the cross-section area AS and the location of the rebar. Meaning you don't have this A. And why do you need A? Because you need this arm between the two forces, right? Between this couple. You need this depth, the distance. And this distance is going to be equal to the depth D subtracting one half of this because this C <coughs> is going to be right in the middle. So this is going to be here, D minus A over two, this distance. So actually, you don't have A. And the only way that you can solve for A, once you set T is going to be equal to C. Same thing. And here's the A equation. It's going to be equal to the tension force. So this is actually the tension force, AS times FY, because we assume that the steel is yielding at the capacity point. So this could be the tension force divided by 0.85 F prime C times B. How did you come up with this? By setting T is going to be equal to C. Here's the tension equation. Here's the C compression equation. Once you set them to each other, you can solve for a Y, because you have the cross-section area of the steel. You know how many rebars you provided. You have the yield trends. This give you a constant. You have the concrete strength. You have B, the width of the beam, and then you have this A. Now, where is this A coming from? This give you your unknown. Once you set them equal to each other, you can solve for A. Once you have A, you can do the arm between the tension to compression. This give you the moment arm, right? Your moment capacity is going to be equal to this tension force multiplied by the moment arm, which makes sense. This moment is going to be either tension or compression multiplied by the distance between the two forces, which means from here to there. Are we good? Time to sleep? We're getting late. Not yet. Not yet. All right. Still have three minutes. I'm going to finish for tonight. These are the load factors. I'm sure that you guys are familiar with these load factors. When you have dead load, live load, and other factors, how do you combine them? And we have this all from the code. Which code? The CBC. 
I said, okay, most likely we're gonna have only dead load and live load for this course. So I would just care about two equations, which is these two equations. I don't have this F, F means fluid. So I'm gonna say, you know what? This gave me the only load I have dead load, right? So we're gonna say 1.4 times dead versus 1.2 times dead plus 1.6 times live. We do this when we do strength design. Let me put a big box here. You see this? When you do strength design. What does it mean by strength design? Meaning that you're gonna have a demand and demand is gonna be based on this given loads. And then you compare it to the capacity of the section. This is gonna be the strength design. So when you say here, a strength design, it means we're gonna be comparing demand to capacity. In any case, if you are doing any design, you're going to say which one now needs to be larger? Capacity to be larger or smaller than demand? What do you guys think? Which one needs to be larger? Capacity. Yeah. All right. This is an old design, but in a case like this, we're talking here about trans design only. Do we have other designs? But for design, I'm going to say yes. We have serviceability design. We need to be sure that the stresses are within the limits that we want it. Have you guys done this in the 408 in the conventional concrete design? I say no. Why didn't we do it? I'll tell you the reason. All what we care about is just capacity and demand in concrete design, conventional concrete design. Because we said, you know what? When it comes to the strain, we assume the concrete is failing at 0.03, okay? Would come to steel stress, we're gonna say it's gonna be equal to Fy. This is gonna be the maximum and worst case. So we're done. We check the stresses because we start by some given stresses. This is not the case in pre-stress. Pre-stress is gonna be much complex than conventional concrete. Why? Because the simplest thing in pre-stress analysis is going to be to determine the capacity. It's going to be so easy because we can just add the effect of the, of the tendons or cables, and that's it. The problem in pre-stress is to calculate the stresses top and bottom due to what? Due to axial load and due to bending. This is why I'm going to take you back here and say, I want you to read this, this combined loading. This combined load is gonna be very important, right? You see this type of stresses? You see this combination of stresses? This is what you're gonna be doing for some time. This is gonna be your life when you come to this course, you know? So you need to know how to combine the stresses, how to do this. This is gonna be so critical for you. This is what you call here serviceability design. So in pre-stress, the big difference between concrete design, conventional concrete design, and pre-stress concrete design, is going to be the serviceability analysis, the amount of checks that you need to do on the stresses, top and bottom in a pre-stress beam. So in a pre-stress beam, we're going to be doing the same conventional design, right? This is going to be there. I'm not saying that this is not going to be there. This design is going to be there. You need to find out the trends, compare it with the demand. So this is going to happen in both conventional and pre-stress concrete. But the thing is, you're going to be adding this to it. You need to check the stresses top and bottom which is gonna be a good section of the analysis. And it's gonna be more critical than figuring out the trends of the beam. Is this because we have control over how much um, tensioning we put? Yeah. Post or pre? Correct. Because okay. the performance of the concrete beam, in this case, the pre-stress is gonna be so critical. You need to be sure that you're not going beyond the stress limits because don't forget, you're gonna take the beam here and then apply the forces on it, right? The post tension, may yeah. or the pre tension. Maybe now it doesn't make sense because you have. I mean, it is not clear yet. We didn't, we didn't go through the fabrication and what type of forces, how they apply the tension, the cable, and therefore compression the beam. It's not clear yet. I also had another question. Um, is there something called strength limit design or stress limit design? The stress limit design is the strength design, but oh, just, okay. it depends on the code. And that just comes straight from the, the material properties of our member. Yeah. 
there is something called uh, BS, B as in boy, S standard, right? As in Sam. Yeah. BS yeah. is the British standard. It's BS 110. It is a British code. In the British code, they don't call it strength design, they call it limited state design. All right, sounds like a lot of BS, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah. You're still awake, it seems. <laughs> yeah, I'm, about to, I'm gonna go to the gym after this, so I have to. Yeah. Well, I need to finish my coffee before I go to bed anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So trans design is the same as limited state design, just to confirm this. And we are going to be doing this in conventional concrete and in pre-stressed concrete. But when it comes to pre-stress, we need to do serviceability analysis. Means we need to keep the stresses in compression at the time of pre-stressing, at the time of use, we're going to have more than one stage. And every time you put new load into the beam, the stress is gonna get changed. So you got to be sure that you're not going beyond the limits. But in here, it is just simple. You just put the beam, you do the loading, applied loading, your demand, you figure out the capacity and then you are done. In some cases, you check deflection for certain beams and then you need the long-term effect or the, the time effect, which is it's not that critical. But in pre-stress is gonna be like time consuming. This is, at this point, you'd appreciate software, right? You're going to say, wow, the software is doing all the checks for us. This is just amazing. But not now. You'll figure this out later on. This is what you call here the capacity, right? All of this gave you the capacity. And all of this, this is what you call here demand. So once you add the term here, P is going to be axial load, moment, shear, and torque. And this term U means ultimate, means demand. Once you say P, P, N, P, N, N, this gives you a capacity thing. We have some explanation for this. Now, the fee factor. Are, are we going to be using this fee factor, whether we have conventional or we have pre stress? I'm going to say, yeah. This gives you the same factors. Tension control, this gives you 0.9. Compression control in axial load. Well, it depends. This gives you 0.65 or 0.75, depends on the type of column, right? How about in the middle? Well, we're gonna have this diagram, like in here, if you guys remember this diagram. Here's gonna be compression control, which means if the tensor strength or the tensor strain is gonna be within the yield point, it's gonna be less than, this is by the way, this like the yield point. This is gonna be the strain due to yield, right? It's gonna be almost 0.02. If you are gonna be in this side, it's gonna be compression control, if it's gonna be higher than 0.05, this is gonna be the tensile strain in the steel. More than 0 0.005, the P factor is gonna be 0 0.9. If it's the middle, it's gonna be transition, and then you have this equation for it, if you like. We'll just draw a line here and figure out the P factor. In pre-stress, yeah, it's true. Sometimes we have a spiral if you have points, but most likely in our business, we're gonna be using the solid line instead of the dashed line. I have here one example in concrete design, that this is also taken from the 408. I let you guys go through it, and next time we can finish it for quick. This gonna be a very small homework. I personally prefer the homework to be due at the end of Sunday. So you don't have to do it during the week. But if everybody agrees, I can do it the day before this course. So for example, it can be, let's say that it's Thursday now, it's gonna be Wednesday, let's say 12 a.m., end of Wednesday, 11.59 p.m. I can do it this way, yeah, or I can do it end of Sunday. If you guys can prefer just to finish it uh, over the weekend, I'm also okay with this. I, I, like I vote for Wednesday. Yeah, I kind of like that flexibility. Yeah, but you need to do it. But but you you need to do it anyways, right? Absolutely. Yeah. We will do it. My grade yeah. depends on it. Okay. Wednesday night. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Absolutely. So if you like to ask questions, you can ask in Tuesdays or maybe send me an email, I can respond. Okay, with that I'm done for uh, tonight. Please go ahead and uh, and it is not going to be uh, 
We can do group project. Why not? We can do group project. But uh, the problem is how many groups and uh, would everyone really work on the project? I don't want someone to come and complain and say, we have this team, but this guy was not working. It happens a lot that some people are getting very busy. They cannot really contribute to the analysis or to the work. So it's gonna be up to you guys. If you decide to have groups, form the groups, and if you don't know anyone taking this class, let me know. We can sort it out. We can figure this out. We still have some time before we start the project. I'll say good night. Go ahead, please, and sign out. Type your name in the chat room. And I'll see you next time. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Have a good weekend, Professor. You too. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Have a great one. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Dr. Lady. Thank All you. Right. Take care. You too. Thank you. You still post the recordings on YouTube? Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. helpful. It's nice to go back and yeah, yeah. up a little bit. Thank you.